From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Sunday afternoon session of the 191st Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Sunday afternoon session of the 191st Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our warmest greetings to members of the church and to friends everywhere who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. We are grateful to those who have carefully prepared and provided the music throughout the conference. Thank you for following established recommendations and guidelines to ensure the safety of all attending the conference. The Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square will provide the music for this session under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy, with Richard Elliott and Andrew Unsworth at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing Glory to God on High. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Matthew S. Holland of the Seventy, after which the choir will sing where can I turn for peace?
Our dear Heavenly Father, we approach Thee with joy and gratitude. We are thankful for the magnificent blessing of this worldwide general conference, full of divine counsel and comfort. We are so thankful for our beloved prophet of God. Please help us to follow his inspired invitation to strengthen our spiritual foundations in an unprecedented way. Above all, we thank Thee for a Savior, for that happy, glorious truth that Jesus Christ lives and that He has overcome the world, that we might overcome all tribulation and return to live with Thee again. Now, as we begin this final session, we pray that we will feel Thy power and that those who may be earnestly searching for direction or weighed down with a special grief, may find healing and answers this very hour. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
We will now be pleased to hear from Elder Garrett W. Gong of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Bishop L. Todd Budge, who serves as second counselor in the presiding bishopric. After his remarks, the choir will sing, I'll follow him in faith. We will then hear from Elders Anthony D. Perkins, Michael A. Dunn, and Sean Douglas of the Seventy. Once when I was very young, I briefly thought about running away from home. In a little boy way, I felt no one loved me. My observant mother listened and assured me I was safely home. Have you ever felt like you were running away from home? Often running from home means trust has been frayed or broken. Trust with ourself, with each other, with God. When trust is challenged, we wonder how to trust again. My message today is whether we are coming home or going home, God is coming to meet us. In him we can find faith and courage, wisdom and discernment to trust again. Likewise, he asks us to keep the light on for each other, to be more forgiving and less judgmental of ourselves and each other, so his church can be a place where we feel at home, whether we're coming for the first time or returning. Trust is an act of faith. God keeps faith with us. Yet human faith can be undermined or broken when a friend, business associate, or someone we trust isn't truthful, hurts, or takes advantage of us. A marriage partner is unfaithful. Perhaps unexpectedly, someone we love confronts death, injury, or illness. We face an unanticipated gospel question perhaps something regarding church history or church policy, and someone says our church somehow hid or did not tell the truth. Other situations may be less specific, but of equal concern. Perhaps we don't see ourselves in the church, don't feel we fit, feel judged by others, or though we have done everything expected, things have yet to work out. Despite our personal experiences with the Holy Ghost, we may not yet feel we know God lives or the gospel's true. Many today feel a great need to restore trust in human relationships and modern society. As we reflect on trust, we know God is a God of truth and canst not lie. We know truth is a knowledge of things as they are, were, and are to come. We know continuing revelation and inspiration fit on changing truth to changing circumstances. We know broken covenants break hearts. I did stupid things, he says. Can you ever forgive me? The husband and wife may hold hands, hoping to trust again. In a different setting, a prison inmate reflects, if I had kept the word of wisdom, I would not be here today. We know joy on the Lord's covenant path and callings to serve in his church are an invitation to fill God's trust and love for us and each other. Church members, including young single adults, regularly serve across the church and in our communities. By inspiration, a bishopric calls a young couple to serve in the ward nursery. At first, the husband sits in the corner, detached and distant. Gradually, he begins smiling with the children. Later, the couple express gratitude. Earlier, they say, the wife wanted children, the husband did not. Now, serving has changed and united them. It has also brought the joy of children into their marriage and home. In another city, a young mother with little children and her husband are surprised and overwhelmed but except when she's called to serve as Ward Relief Society president, 
Shortly thereafter, ice storms cut electric power, leaving store shelves empty and homes as cold as ice boxes. Because they have power and heat, this young family generously opens their home to several families and individuals to weather the storm. Trust becomes real when we do hard things with faith. Service and sacrifice increase capacity and refine hearts. Trusting God in each other brings heaven's blessings. After surviving cancer, a faithful brother is hit by a car. Instead of feeling sorry for himself, he prayerfully asks, what can I learn from this experience? In his intensive care unit, he feels prompted to notice a nurse worried for her husband and children. A patient in pain finds answers as he trusts God and reaches out to others. As a brother with pornography concerns waits outside his office, a state president prays to know how to help. A clear impression comes. Open the door and let the brother in. With faith and trust, God will help. The priesthood leader opens the door and embraces the brother. Each feels the transforming love of trust for God and each other. Fortified, the brother can begin to repent and change. While our individual circumstances are personal, gospel principles and the Holy Ghost can help us know if, how, and when to trust in others again. When trust is broken or betrayed, disappointment and disillusionment are real. So is the need for discernment to know when faith and courage are merited to trust again in human relations. Yet with respect to God and personal revelation, President Russell M. Nelson assures, quote, you do not have to wonder whom you can safely trust, end quote. We can always trust God. The Lord knows us better and loves us more than we know or love ourselves. His infinite love and perfect knowledge of past, present, and future make his covenants and promises constant and sure. Trust what the scriptures call in the process of time. With God's blessing, process of time, and continuing faith and obedience, we can find resolution and peace. The Lord comforts. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Cast your burdens upon the Lord and trust his constant care. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Trust God in his miracles. We in our relationships can change. Through the atonement of Christ the Lord, we can put off our selfish, natural self and become a child of God, meek, humble, full of faith and appropriate trust. When we repent, when we confess and forsake our sins, the Lord says he remembers them no more. It is not that he forgets. Rather, in a remarkable way, it seems he chooses not to remember them, nor need we. Trust God's inspiration to discern wisely. We can forgive others in the right time and way as the Lord says we must, while being wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Sometimes when our hearts are most broken and contrite, we are most open to the comfort and guidance of the Holy Ghost. Condemnation and forgiveness both begin by recognizing a wrong. Often, condemnation focuses on the past. Forgiveness looks liberatingly to the future. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The Apostle Paul asks, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He answers, neither death nor life nor height nor depth shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yet there is someone who can separate us from God in Jesus Christ, and that someone is us, ourselves. As Jesus, as Isaiah says, your sins have hidden his face from you. By divine love and divine law, 
We're responsible for our choices and their consequences. But our Savior's atoning love is infinite and eternal. When we're ready to come home, even when we are yet a great far off, God is ready with great compassion to welcome us, joyfully offering the best he has. President J. Reuben Clark said, quote, I believe that our Heavenly Father wants to save every one of his children, that in his justice and mercy, he will give us the maximum reward for our acts, give us all that he can give, and in the reverse, I believe he will impose upon us the minimum penalty which it is possible for him to impose." Close quote. On the cross, even our Savior's merciful plea to his Father was not an unconditional, Father, forgive them, but rather, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Our agency and freedom have meaning because we're accountable before God and ourselves for who we are for what we know and do. Thankfully, we can trust God's perfect justice and perfect mercy to judge perfectly our intents and actions. We conclude as we begin with God's compassion as we each come home to him and each other. Do you remember Jesus Christ's parable about a certain man who had two sons? One son left home and wasted his inheritance. When he came to himself, this son sought to come home. The other son, feeling he had kept the commandments low these many years, did not want to welcome his brother home. Brothers and sisters, would you please consider Jesus is asking us to open our hearts, our understanding, compassion, and humility, and to see ourselves in both roles. Like the first son or daughter, we may wander and later seek to return home. God waits to welcome us. And like the other son or daughter, God gently entreats us to rejoice together as we each come home to him. He invites us to make our congregations, quorums, classes, and activities open, authentic, safe home for each other. With kindness, understanding, and mutual respect, we each humbly seek the Lord and pray and welcome his restored gospel blessings for all. Our life journeys are individual, but we can come again to God, God our Father and his beloved Son through trusting God, each other, and ourselves. Jesus beckons, be not afraid, only believe. As did the prophet Joseph, undaunted may we trust in our Heavenly Father's care. Dear brother, dear sister, dear friend, please look again for faith and trust, a miracle he promises you today. In the sacred and holy name of Jesus Christ, amen. Last year, while serving in the Asian North Area Presidency, I received a call from President Russell M. Nelson inviting me to serve as a second counselor in the presiding bishopric. He graciously invited my wife, Lori, to join the conversation. After the call was finished, we were still in a state of disbelief when my wife asked, what does the presiding bishopric, bishopric do anyway? After a moment's reflection, I responded, I don't know exactly. A year later, and after profound feelings of humility and gratitude, I can answer my wife's question with greater understanding. Among many other things, the presiding bishopric oversees the welfare and humanitarian work of the Church. The work now spans the entire globe and blesses more of God's children than ever before. As a presiding bishopric, we are assisted by wonderful Church employees and others, including the Relief Society General Presidency, who serve with us on the Church's Welfare and Self-Reliance Executive Committee. In our capacity as members of that committee, the First Presidency asked me, as well as, 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 well as Sister Eubank, who spoke to us last evening, to share with you an update on the Church's recent humanitarian efforts. They also particularly requested that we express their profound gratitude 
because brothers and sisters, it is you who have made those humanitarian efforts possible. As we observed with concern the early economic effects of the COVID-19 crisis across the world, we could have easily expected a decline in the monetary contributions which the saints were able to give. After all, our own members were not immune to the setbacks from the pandemic. Imagine our feelings when we observe just the opposite. Humanitarian donations in 2020 turned out to be the highest ever and are trending even higher this year. As a result of your generosity, the Church has been able to realize its most extensive response since the inception of the Humanitarian Fund, with over 1,500 COVID relief projects in more than 150 countries. These donations, which you have given so selflessly to the Lord, have been converted to life-sustaining food, oxygen, medical supplies, and vaccinations for those who might otherwise have gone without. Just as significant as the contributions of goods is the tremendous outpouring of time and energy which Church members donate to humanitarian causes. Even as the pandemic has raged, natural disasters, civil conflict, and economic instability have been unrelenting and have continued to drive millions of people from their homes. The United Nations now reports that there are over 82 million forcibly displaced people in the world. Add to this the millions of others who elect to flee from poverty or oppression, in search of a better life for themselves or their children, and you can begin to catch a glimpse of the magnitude of this global situation. I am pleased to report that thanks to the volunteer time and talents of so many, the Church operates refugee and immigrant welcome centers in multiple locations in the United States and Europe. And thanks to your contributions, we provide goods, funding, and volunteers to help similar programs run by other organizations throughout the world. May I extend my heartfelt gratitude to those saints who have reached out to feed, clothe, befriend, and help these refugees become established and self-sufficient. Yesterday evening, Sister Eubank shared with you a few of the saints' wonderful efforts in this regard. As I reflect on these efforts, my thoughts often turn to the principle of sacrifice and the direct connection of this principle to the two great commandments of loving God and loving our neighbor. In modern usage, the term sacrifice has come to connote the concept of giving up things for the Lord and His kingdom. However, in ancient days, the meaning of the word sacrifice was more closely tied to its two Latin roots, sacer, meaning sacred or holy, and facere, meaning to make. Thus, anciently, sacrifice meant literally to make something or someone holy. Viewed as such, sacrifice is a process of becoming holy and coming to know God, not an event or ritualistic giving up of things for the Lord. The Lord said, I desire charity and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The Lord wants us to become holy, to be possessed of charity, and to come to know Him. As the Apostle Paul taught, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Ultimately, the Lord wants our hearts. He wants us to become new creatures in Christ. As He instructed the Nephites, She shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Sacrifice is less about giving up and more about giving to the Lord. Engraved upon the entrance to each of our temples are the words, Holiness to the Lord, the house of the Lord. As we observe our covenants by sacrifice, we are made holy through the grace of Jesus Christ, and at the altars of the holy temple, with broken hearts and contrite spirits, we give our holiness to the Lord. Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught, The submission of one's will or heart is really the only uniquely personal thing we have to place on God's altar. However, when you and I finally submit ourselves by letting our individual wills be swallowed up in God's will, then we are really giving something to Him. When our sacrifices on behalf of others are viewed from the perspective of giving up, we may see them as a burden and become discouraged when our sacrifices are not recognized or rewarded. However, when viewed from the perspective of giving to the Lord, our sacrifices on behalf of others become gifts, and the joy of generously giving becomes its own reward. Freed from the need for love, approval, or appreciation from others, 
Our sacrifices become the purest and deepest expressions of our gratitude and love for the Savior and our fellow men. Any prideful sense of self-sacrifice gives way to feelings of gratitude, generosity, contentment, and joy. Something is made holy, whether it be our lives, our possessions, our time, or our talents, not simply by giving it up, but rather by consecrating it to the Lord. The humanitarian work of the Church is such a gift. It is the product of the collective, consecrated offerings of the Saints, a manifestation of our love for God and His children. Stephen and Anita Canfield are representative of Latter-day Saints throughout the world who have experienced for themselves the transformative blessings of giving to the Lord. As welfare and self-reliance missionaries, the Canfields were asked to provide aid at refugee camps and immigrant centers across Europe. In her professional life, Sister Canfield had been a world-class interior designer, contracted by wealthy clients to beautify their luxury homes. Suddenly, she found herself thrust into a world that was the complete opposite as she served among people who had lost nearly everything in terms of earthly possessions. In her words, she exchanged marble walkways for dirt floors, and in doing so, she found an immeasurable degree of fulfillment as she and her husband began to befriend and soon to love and embrace those who needed their care. The Canfields observed, we did not feel as though we had given up anything to serve the Lord. Our desire was simply to give to Him our time and energies to bless His children in whatever way He saw fit to use us. As we worked alongside our brothers and sisters, any outward appearances, any differences in backgrounds or belongings dissolved for us, and we simply saw one another's hearts. There is no degree of career success or material gains that could have equaled the way that these experiences, serving among the humblest of God's children, enriched us. The Canfield story and so many others like it have helped me appreciate the lyrics of a simple yet profound primary song. Give, said the little stream as it hurried down the hill. I'm small, I know, but wherever I go, the fields grow greener still. Yes, each of us is small, but together as we hasten to give to God and our fellow men, wherever we go, lives are enriched and blessed. The third verse of this song is less well known, but concludes with this loving invitation. Give then as Jesus gives. There is something all can give. Do as the streams and blossoms do, for God and others live. Dear brothers and sisters, as we live for God and others, by giving of our means, our time, and yes, even of ourselves, we are leaving the world a little greener, leaving God's children a little happier, and in the process, becoming a little holier. May the Lord bless you richly for the sacrifices that you give to Him so freely. I testify that God lives. Man of holiness is His name. Jesus Christ is His Son and he is the giver of all good gifts. May we, through his grace and the observance of our covenants by sacrifice, be made holy and ever give more love and holiness to the Lord. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
Heavenly Father's plan of happiness includes a mortal experience where all of his children will be tested and face trials. Five years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. I have felt and still feel the physical pains from surgeries, radiation treatments, and medication side effects. I have experienced emotional struggles during torturous sleepless nights. Medical statistics indicate I will probably depart mortality earlier than I ever expected, leaving behind, for a season, a family who means everything to me. Regardless of where you live, physical or emotional suffering from a variety of trials and mortal weaknesses has been, is now, or will someday be part of your life. Physical suffering can result from natural aging, unexpected diseases, and random accidents, hunger or homelessness, or abuse, violent acts, and war. Emotional suffering can arise from anxiety or depression, the betrayal of a spouse, parent, or trusted leader, employment or financial reversals, unfair judgment by others, the choices of friends, children, or other family members, abuse in its many forms, unfulfilled dreams of marriage or children, the severe illness or early death of loved ones, or so many other sources. How can you possibly endure the unique and sometimes debilitating suffering that comes to each of us? Gratefully, hope is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and hope can also be part of your life. Today, I share four principles of hope drawn from scripture, prophetic teachings, many ministering visits, and my own ongoing health trial. These principles are not just broadly applicable, but also deeply personal. First, suffering does not mean God is displeased with your life. 2,000 years ago, Jesus' disciples saw a blind man at the temple and asked, Master, who did sin? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. His disciples seem to incorrectly believe, as do far too many people today, that all hardship and suffering in life are the result of sin. But the Savior replied, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. The work of God is to bring to pass our immortality and eternal life. But how can trials and suffering, especially suffering imposed by another person's sinful use of agency, ultimately advance God's work? The Lord told His covenant people, I have refined thee, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Whatever the cause of your sufferings, your loving Heavenly Father can direct them to refine your soul. Refined souls can bear others' burdens with true empathy and compassion. Refined souls who have come out of great tribulation are prepared to joyfully live in God's presence forever, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Second, Heavenly Father is intimately aware of your suffering. While in the midst of trials, we can mistakenly think that God is far away and unconcerned with our pain. Even the prophet Joseph Smith expressed this feeling at a low point in his life. When imprisoned in Liberty Jail, while thousands of Latter-day Saints were being driven from their homes, Joseph sought understanding through prayer. O oh God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? He ended with this plea, Remember thy suffering saints, O oh our God. The Lord's answer reassured Joseph and all who suffer, quote, My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine afflictions shall be but a small moment, and then, if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Many suffering saints have shared with me how they felt God's love during their trials. I vividly recall my own experience at one point in my cancer battle when the doctors had not yet diagnosed the cause of some severe pain. I sat with my wife, intending to offer a routine blessing on our lunch. Instead, all I could do was simply weep, Heavenly Father, please help me. 
I am so sick. For the next 20 to 30 seconds, I was encircled in his love. I was given no reason for my illness, no indication of the ultimate outcome, and no relief from the pain. I just felt of his pure love, and that was and is enough. I witness that our Heavenly Father, who notes the fall of even a single sparrow, is aware of your suffering. Third, Jesus Christ offers his enabling power to help you have strength to endure your suffering well. This enabling power is made possible through his atonement. I fear that too many Church members think if they are just a little tougher, they can get through any suffering on their own. This is a hard way to live. Your temporary moment of strength can never compare to the Savior's infinite supply of power to fortify your soul. The Book of Mormon teaches that Jesus Christ would take upon Him our pains, sicknesses, and infirmities so He can succor us. How can you draw upon the power that Jesus Christ offers to succor you and strengthen you in times of suffering? The key is binding yourself to the Savior by keeping the covenants you have made with Him. We make these covenants as we receive priesthood ordinances. The people of Alma entered into the covenant of baptism. Later they suffered in bondage and were forbidden to worship publicly or even pray aloud. Yet they kept their covenants the best they could by crying out silently in their hearts. As a result, divine power came. The Lord did strengthen them that they could bear up their burdens with ease. In our day, the Savior invites, Look unto me in every thought. Doubt not. Fear not. When we keep our sacrament covenant to always remember Him, He promises that His Spirit will be with us. The Spirit gives us strength to endure trials and do what we cannot possibly do on our own. The Spirit can heal us, although, as President James E. Faust taught, quote, some of this healing may take place in another world, close quote. We are also blessed by temple covenants and ordinances where the power of godliness is manifest. I visited a woman who had lost a teenage daughter in a terrible accident then later her husband to cancer. I asked, how could she endure such loss and suffering? She replied that strength came from spiritual reassurances of an eternal family received during regular temple worship. As promised, the ordinances of the Lord's house had armed her with God's power. Fourth, choose to find joy each day. Those who suffer often feel that the night just goes on and on, and daylight will never come. It is okay to weep. Yet, if you find yourself in dark nights of suffering, by choosing faith, you can awake to bright mornings of rejoicing. For example, I visited a young mother being treated for cancer, smiling majestically in her chair despite the pain and a lack of hair. I met a middle-aged couple happily serving as youth leaders, though they were unable to conceive children. I sat with a dear woman, a young grandmother, mother, and wife, who would pass away within days. Yet amid the family's tears were laughter and joyful recollections. These suffering saints exemplify what President Russell M. Nelson has taught, quote, The joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. When the focus of our lives is on God's plan of salvation and Jesus Christ and His gospel, we can feel joy regardless of what is happening or not happening in our lives. I testify that our Heavenly Father remembers His suffering saints, loves you, and is intimately aware of you. Our Savior knows how you feel. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I know, as a daily recipient, keeping covenants unlocks the power of Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice to provide strength and even joy to you who suffer. For all who suffer, I pray, may God grant unto you that your burdens may be light through the joy of His Son. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 
For more than a century, the national bicycle racing teams of Great Britain had been the laughing stock of the cycling world. Mired in mediocrity, British riders had managed only a handful of gold medals in a hundred years of Olympic competitions, and had been even more underwhelming in cycling's marquee event, the three-week-long Tour de France, where no British rider had prevailed in 110 years. Now, so sorry was the plight of British riders that some bike manufacturers refused to even sell bikes to the Brits, fearing it would forever sully their hard-won reputations. And despite devoting enormous resources into cutting-edge technology and every newfangled training regimen, nothing worked. Well, nothing that is until 2003, when a small, largely unnoticed change occurred that would forever alter the trajectory of British cycling. That new approach would also reveal an eternal principle with a promise regarding our oft-times perplexing mortal quest to improve ourselves. So what happened in British cycling that has great relevance to our personal pursuit to be better daughters and sons of God? Well, in 2003, Sir Dave Brailsford was hired. And unlike previous coaches who attempted dramatic overnight turnarounds, Sir Brailsford instead committed to a strategy he referred to as the aggregation of marginal gains. Now, this entailed implementing small improvements in everything. That meant constantly measuring key statistics and training targeting specific weaknesses. It's somewhat akin to the prophet Samuel the Lamanite's notion of walking circumspectly. Now, this broader, more holistic view avoids the trap of being myopically fixated on just the obvious problem or sin at hand. Said Brailsford, the whole principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike and then improve it by just 1%, you will get a significant increase when you put them all together. Now, his approach aligns well with the Lord's, who taught us the criticalness of the 1%, even at the expense of the 99%. Now, of course, he was teaching the gospel imperative to seek out individuals in need. But what if we applied that same principle to the very sweet and savory second principle of the gospel, repentance? Rather than being stymied by the churn and dramatic swings between sin and repentance, what if our approach was to narrow our focus even as we broadened it? Instead of trying to perfect everything, what if we tackled just one thing? For example, what if in your new wide-angle awareness you discover you would neglected a daily reading of the Book of Mormon? Well, instead of desperately plowing through all 536 pages in one night, what if we committed instead to read just 1% of it? That's just five pages a day or another manageable goal for your situation. Could aggregating small but steady marginal gains in our lives finally be the way to victory over even the most pesky of our personal shortcomings? Can this bite-sized approach to tackling our blemishes really work? Well, acclaimed author James Clear says this strategy puts the math squarely in our favor. He maintains that Habits are the compound interest of self-improvement. If you can get just 1% better at something each day, by the end of a year, you will be 37 times better. Now, Brailsford's small gains begin with the obvious, such as equipment, kit fabrics, and training patterns. But his team didn't stop there. They continued to find 1% improvements in overlooked and unexpected areas, such as nutrition and even maintenance nuances. Over time, these myriad of micro-betterments aggregated into stunning results which came faster than anyone could have imagined. Truly, they were on to the eternal principle of line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Well, will little adjustments work that mighty change that you desire? Properly implemented, I'm 99% certain they will. But the one caveat with this approach is that for small gains to aggregate, there must be a consistent day in and day out effort. And although we likely won't be perfect, we must be determined to mirror our persistence with patience. Do that and the sweet rewards of increased righteousness will bring you the joy and peace which you seek. As President Nelson has taught, 
Nothing is more liberating, more ennobling, or more crucial to our individual progression than is a regular daily focus on repentance. Repentance is not an event. It is a process. It is the key to happiness and peace of mind. When coupled with faith, repentance opens our access to the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Now, as to repentance as prerequisite of faith, the scriptures are very clear. All that's initially required is a mere particle of faith. And if we can muster this mustard seed mentality, we too can expect unexpected and exceptional improvements in our lives. But remember, just as we would not attempt to go from being Attila the Hun to Mother Teresa overnight, so too should we reorient our patterns of improvement incrementally. Even if the changes needed in your life are wholesale, begin at a small scale. That's especially true if you're feeling overwhelmed or discouraged. This process is not always accomplished in a linear fashion. Even among the most determined, there may be setbacks. Now, having experienced the frustration of this in my own life, I can tell you that it can sometimes feel like 1% forward and then 2% back. Yet if we remain undaunted in our determination to consistently eke out those 1% gains, he who has carried our sorrows will surely carry us. Now, obviously, if we are involved in grievous sins, the Lord is clear and unequivocal. We need to stop, get help from our bishop, and turn away from such practices immediately. But as Elder David A. Bednar enjoined, small, steady, incremental spiritual improvements are the steps the Lord would have us take. Preparing to walk guiltless before God is one of the primary purposes of mortality and the pursuit of a lifetime. It does not result from sporadic spurts of intense spiritual activity. So, does this pocket-sized approach to repentance and real change really work? Is the proof in the peddling, so to speak? Well, consider what's happened to British cycling in the past two decades since implementing this philosophy. British cyclists have now won the storied Tour de France an astonishing six times. During the past four Olympic Games, Great Britain has been the most successful country across all cycling disciplines. And in the recently concluded Tokyo Olympics, the UK won more gold medals in cycling than any other country. But far outshining worldly silver or gold, our precious promise down our roadway to the eternities is that we will indeed triumph in Christ. And as we commit to making small but steady improvements, we are promised a crown of glory that fadeth not away. With basking in that undimmable luster beckoning, I invite you to examine your life and see what stagnated or possibly slowed you on the covenant pathway. Then look broader, seek modest but makeable fixes in your life that might result in the sweet joy of being just a little better. Remember, David used just one small stone to take down a seemingly invincible giant, but he had four other stones at the ready. Similarly, Alma the Younger's wicked disposition and eternal destiny was altered by just one simple salient thought, a remembrance of his father's teachings about the saving graces of Jesus Christ. And so it is with our Savior, who, though sinless, received not of the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace until he received a fullness. It is he who knows when a sparrow falls that is likewise focused on the minute as well as the momentous moments in our lives, and who is ready right now to assist you in whatever your 1% quest is coming out of this conference. Because every effort to change we make, no matter how tiny it seems to us, just might make the biggest difference in your life. To this end, Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught, each assertion of a righteous desire, each act of service, and each act of worship, however small and incremental, adds to our spiritual momentum. Truly, it is by small, simple, and yes, even just 1% things that great things can be brought to pass. Ultimate victory is 100% certain after all we can do through the might, merits, and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
For the past six years, my sweetheart Anne and I have lived in Texas, near the Gulf Coast, where some of the largest hurricanes have struck the United States, leaving behind tremendous destruction and even loss of life. Sadly enough, recent months have been no stranger to such devastating events. Our love and prayers extend to all who have been impacted in any way. In 2017, we personally experienced Hurricane Harvey, which dropped record rainfall of up to 60 inches. Natural laws govern the formation of hurricanes. The ocean temperature must be at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit, extending to 165 feet below the ocean surface. As wind meets the warm ocean water, it causes the water to vaporize and rise into the atmosphere, where it liquefies. Clouds then form, and winds produce a spiral pattern over the ocean surface. Hurricanes are colossal in size, reaching 50,000 feet or more into the atmosphere and spanning at least 125 miles across. Interestingly, as hurricanes meet land, they begin to weaken because they are no longer above the warm waters required to fuel their strength. You may never face a devastating physical hurricane. However, each of us has weathered and will weather spiritual hurricanes that threaten our peace and try our faith. In today's world, they seem to be increasing in frequency and intensity. Thankfully, the Lord has provided us a sure way to joyfully overcome them. By living the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are assured that when dark clouds of trouble, trouble hang o'er us and threaten our peace to destroy, there is hope smiling brightly before us. President Russell M. Nelson explained, saints can be happy under every circumstance. We can feel joy even while having a bad day, a bad week, or even a bad year. The joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. When the focus of our lives is on Jesus Christ and His gospel, we can feel joy regardless of what is happening or not happening in our lives. Just as natural laws govern physical hurricanes, divine laws govern how to feel joy during our spiritual hurricanes. The joy or misery we feel as we brave the storms of life is tied to the laws that God has set. President Nelson has shared, they're called commandments, but they are just as true as the law of lift, the law of gravity, and the law that governs the heartbeat. President Nelson continues, it becomes a rather simple formula. If you want to be happy, keep the commandments. Doubt is an enemy of faith and joy. Just as warm ocean water is the breeding ground for hurricanes, doubt is the breeding ground for spiritual hurricanes. Just as belief is a choice, so is doubt. When we choose to doubt, we choose to be acted upon, yielding power to the adversary, thereby leaving us weak and vulnerable. Satan seeks to lead us to the breeding ground of doubt. He seeks to harden our hearts so that we will not believe. The breeding ground of doubt can appear inviting because its seemingly peaceful, warm waters do not require us to live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. In such waters, Satan tempts us to relax our spiritual vigilance. That inattention can induce a lack of spiritual conviction. Well, we are neither cold nor hot. If we are not anchored on Christ, doubt and its allures will lead us away to apathy, where we shall find neither miracles, lasting happiness, nor rest unto our souls. Just as hurricanes weaken over land, Doubt is replaced with faith as we build our foundation on Christ. We are then able to see spiritual hurricanes in their proper perspective, and our capacity to overcome them is enlarged. Then, when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, 
it shall have no power to drag us down to the gulf of misery and endless woe because of the rock upon which we are built, which is a sure foundation. President Nelson has taught, faith in Jesus Christ is the foundation of all belief and the conduit of divine power. The Lord does not require perfect faith for us to have access to his perfect power, but he does ask us to believe. Since April General Conference, my family and I have been seeking to strengthen our faith in Jesus Christ and His Atonement to help us turn our challenges into unparalleled growth and opportunity. Our granddaughter Ruby has been blessed with a strong, take-charge will. When she was born, her esophagus was not attached to her stomach. Even as an infant, Ruby, with her parents' help, met this trial with unusual determination. Ruby is now five years old. Though she is still very young, she is a powerful example of not letting her circumstances determine her happiness. She is always happy. Last May, Ruby faced an additional hurricane in her life with faith. She was also born with a less than fully developed hand that needed reconstructive surgery. Prior to this rather complex operation, we visited with her, and we gave her a drawing that beautifully depicts a child's hand warmly holding the hand of the Savior. When we asked her if she was nervous, she replied, no, I am happy. Then we asked her, Ruby, how is that so? Ruby confidently asserted, because I know that Jesus will hold my hand. Ruby's recovery has been miraculous, and she continues to be happy. How the purity of a child's faith contrasts with the foolishness of doubt that can frequently tempt us as we get older. But we can all become as little children and choose to put aside our unbelief. It is a simple choice. A caring father diligently pled with the Savior, saying, If thou canst do anything, help us. Jesus then said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. This humble father wisely chose to trust his belief in Christ rather than his doubt. President Nelson shared, Only your unbelief will keep God from blessing you with miracles to move the mountains in your life. How merciful is our God to place the bar for us at the level of believing and not at the level of knowing. Alma teaches, Blessed is he that believeth in the word of God, for God is merciful unto all who believe on his name. Therefore, he desireth in the first place that ye should believe. Yes, in the first place, God desires that we believe in Him. We face our spiritual hurricanes best by believing in Christ and keeping His commandments. Our belief and obedience link us to power beyond our own to overcome whatever is happening or not happening in our lives. Yes, God doth immediately bless us for believing and obeying in fact, over time, our state of being changes to happiness, and we are made alive in Christ as we exercise our faith in Him and keep His commandments. Brothers and sisters, may we choose today to doubt not, but be believing. The right way is to believe in Christ. We are graven on the palms of His hands. He is our Savior and Redeemer, who stands at our very door and knocks. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The congregation will now join the choir in singing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. After the singing, we will hear from Elders Carlos G. Revilio, Jr., and Alvin F. Meredith III of the Seventy. 
They will be followed by Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This is the Sunday afternoon session of the 191st Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mabuhay, I bring to you love and warm smiles from the wonderful saints of the Philippines. This year marks 60 years since the first missionaries arrived in the islands of the Philippines. Today, there are 23 missions and more than 800,000 members of the church in 123 stakes. There are now seven temples in operation under construction or announced. This is truly a miracle. We are witnessing the fulfillment of the prophecy in 2 Nephi chapter 10, verse 21. Great are the promises of the Lord unto them who are upon the isles of the sea. This miracle is also a fulfillment of the prophecy given in a prayer by then Elder Gordon B. Hinckley in Manila in 1961. In that prayer, Elder Hinckley stated, we invoke thy blessings upon the people of this land, that they shall be friendly and hospitable and kind and gracious to those who shall come here, and that many, yea, Lord, we pray that there shall be many, many thousands who shall receive this message and be blessed thereby. Wilt thou bless them with receptive minds and understanding hearts, and with faith to receive, and with courage to live the principles of the gospel. Beyond the many, many thousands of faithful Latter-day Saints, the miracle of the gospel has brought positive changes to the country and its people. I am a living witness of this. I was six years old when my parents joined the church 
in the southern island of Mindanao. At that time, there was only one mission in the entire country and no stakes. I am eternally grateful for my parents' courage and commitment to follow the Savior. I honored them and all the pioneers of the church in the Philippines. They paved the way for the succeeding generations to be blessed. King Benjamin in the Book of Mormon said, And moreover, I would desire that you should consider on the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. As we live and obey the principles and ordinances of the gospel, we are blessed, changed, and converted to becoming more like Jesus Christ. That was how the gospel changed and blessed the Filipino saints, including my family. The gospel is truly the way to a happy, abundant life. The first principle of the gospel is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many Filipinos have a natural belief in God. It is easy for us to trust Jesus Christ and know that we can receive answers to our prayers. The Obidosa family is a great example of this. Brother Obidosa was my branch president when I was a young man. Brother and Sister Obidosa's greatest desire was to be sealed to their family in the Manila Temple. They lived in General Santos City, 1,000 miles away from Manila. For the family of nine, making the journey to the temple seemed impossible. But like the merchant man who went and sold all he had to buy one pearl of great price, this couple decided to sell their house to pay for the trip. Sister Obidosa was worried because they would have no home to return to. But Brother Obidosa assured her that the Lord would provide. They were sealed as a family for time and all eternity in the temple in 1985. In the temple, they found joy incomparable, their priceless pearl. And true to Brother Obedos' words, the Lord did provide. On their return from Manila, kind acquaintances gave them places to stay, and they eventually acquired their own home. The Lord takes care of those who demonstrate their faith in Him. The second principle of the gospel is repentance. Repentance is turning away from sin and turning to God for forgiveness. It is a change of mind and heart. As President Nelson teaches, it is doing and being a little better each day. Repentance is a lot like soap. As a young chemical engineer, I worked in a soap factory in the Philippines. I learned how to make soap and the process of how it works. When you mix oils with an alkali base and add antibacterial agents, it creates a powerful substance that can eliminate bacteria and viruses. Like soap, repentance is a cleaning agent. It allows us the opportunity to get rid of our impurities and our old debris, so we are worthy to be with God as no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of God. Through repentance, we draw upon the cleansing, sanctifying power of Jesus Christ. It is a key part of the process of conversion. This is what happened to the anti-Nephi Lehi's in the Book of Mormon. They were Lamanites who were so completely converted that they never did fall away. They buried their weapons of war and never took them up again. They would rather die than break that covenant. And they proved it. We know that their sacrifice brought miracles. Thousands who fought against them threw down their weapons and were converted. Years later, their sons, who we know as the mighty stripling warriors, were protected in battle against incredible odds. My family and many Filipino saints went through a similar conversion process. When we accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ and joined the church, 
we changed our ways and our culture to align to the gospel. We had to let go of wrong traditions. I saw this in my father when he learned of the gospel and repented. He was a heavy smoker, but he threw his cigarettes away and never touched one again. Because of his decision to change, four generations from him have been blessed. Repentance leads us to make and keep covenants through sacred ordinances. The first ordinance of salvation and exaltation is baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. Baptism allows us to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and enter into a covenant with the Lord. We can renew this baptismal covenant every week as we take the sacrament. This too is a miracle. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to bring this miracle into your life. Come unto Jesus Christ and choose to exercise your faith in Him. Repent and make and keep the covenants found in the ordinances of salvation and exaltation. This will allow you to be yoked with Christ and receive the power and blessings of godliness. I testify of the reality of Jesus Christ and that He lives and loves each one of us. I know that His gospel can bring us hope, peace, and joy. Not only now, but it will bless countless others in future generations. That is the reason for the beautiful and warm smiles of the Filipino saints. It is the miracle of the gospel and the doctrine of Christ. I testify of this in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. When I turned 15 years old, I received a learner's permit, which allowed me to drive a car if one of my parents was with me. When my father asked if I would like to, like to go for a drive, I was thrilled. He drove a few miles to the outskirts of town to a long, straight, two-lane road that few people used. I should note, likely the only place he would have felt safe. He pulled over on the shoulder of the road and we switched seats. He gave me some coaching and then told me, ease out onto the road and just drive until I tell you to stop. I followed his orders exactly, but after about 60 seconds, he said, son, pull the car over, you're making me nauseous. You're swerving all over the road. He asked, what are you looking at? With some exasperation, I said, I'm looking at the road. Then he said this, I'm watching your eyes and you are only looking at what is right in front of the hood of the car. If you only look at what is directly in front of you, you will never drive straight. Then he emphasized, look down the road. That will help you drive straight. As a 15 year old, I thought that was a good driving lesson. I have since realized that that was a great life lesson as well. Focusing on the things that are most important, especially those things down the road, those eternal things, is a key to maneuvering through this life. On one occasion in the Savior's life, he desired to be alone, so he went up into a mountain apart to pray. He sent his disciples away with instructions to cross the sea. In the dark of the night, the ship that carried the disciples came upon a ferocious storm. Jesus went to the rescue, but in an unconventional way. The scripture account reads, In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. When they saw him, they began to fear, for they thought that the figure that approached them was some sort of ghost or phantom. Jesus, sensing their trepidation and wanting to put their minds and hearts at ease, called to them, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Peter was not only relieved, but also emboldened. Ever courageous and often impetuous, Peter cried out to Jesus, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Jesus replied with his familiar and timeless invitation, come. 
Peter, surely thrilled by the prospect, climbed out of the boat, not into the water, but onto the water. While he focused on the Savior, he could do the impossible, even walk on water. Initially, Peter was undeterred by the storm, but the boisterous wind eventually distracted him, and he lost his focus. The fear returned. Consequently, his faith diminished, and he began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. The Savior, who was always eager to save, reached out and lifted him up to safety. There are a myriad of lessons to learn from this miraculous account, but I will mention three. The first lesson, focus on Jesus Christ. While Peter kept his eyes focused on Jesus, he could walk on water. The storm, the waves, and the wind could not hinder him as long as he centered his focus on the Savior. Understanding our ultimate purpose helps us to determine what our focus should be. We cannot play a successful game without knowing the goal, nor can we live a meaningful life without knowing its purpose. One of the great blessings of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ is that it answers, among other things, the question, what is the purpose of life? Our purpose in this life is to have joy and prepare to return to God's presence. Remembering that we are here on earth to prepare to return to live with God helps us focus on the things that lead us to Christ. Focusing on Christ requires discipline, especially about the small and simple spiritual habits that help us become better disciples. There is no discipleship without discipline. Our focus on Christ becomes more clear when we look down the road at where we want to be and who we want to become and then make time every day to do those things that will help us get there. Focusing on Christ can simplify our decisions and provide a guide for how we best spend our time and resources. While there are many things worthy of our focus, we learn from Peter's example the importance of always keeping Christ at the center of our focus. It is only through Christ that we can return to live with God. We rely on the grace of Christ as we strive to become like him and seek his forgiveness and strengthening power when we fall short. The second lesson, beware of distractions. When Peter turned his focus away from Jesus and toward the wind and the waves that whipped at his feet, he began to sink. There are many things in front of the hood that can distract us from focusing on Christ and eternal things that are down the road. The devil is the great distractor. We learn from Lehi's dream that voices from the great and spacious building seek to lure us to things that will take us off the course of preparing to return to live with God. But there are other less obvious distractions that can be just as dangerous. As the saying goes, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The adversary seems determined to get good people to do nothing, or at least to waste their time on things that will distract them from their lofty purposes and goals. For example, some things that are healthy diversions and moderation can become unhealthy distractions without discipline. The adversary understands distractions do not have to be bad or immoral to be effective. The third lesson, we can be rescued. When Peter began to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. When we find ourselves sinking, when we face affliction, or when we falter, we too can be rescued by him. In the face of affliction or trial, you may be like me and hope that the rescue will be immediate. But remember that the Savior came to the aid of the apostles in the fourth watch of the night, after they had spent most of the night toiling in the storm. We may pray that if the help will not come immediately, it will at least come in the second watch or even the third watch of the proverbial night. When we must wait, rest assured that the Savior is always watching, ensuring that we will not have to endure more than we can bear. 
to those who are waiting in the fourth watch of the night, perhaps still in the midst of suffering, do not lose hope. Rescue always comes to the faithful, whether during mortality or in the eternities. Sometimes our sinking comes because of our mistakes and transgressions. If you find yourself sinking for those reasons, make the joyful choice to repent. I believe that few things give the Savior more joy than saving those who turn or return to him. The scriptures are full of stories of people who were once fallen and flawed, but who repented and became firm in the faith of Christ. I think those stories are in the scriptures to remind us that the Savior's love for us and his power to redeem us are infinite. Not only does the Savior have joy when we repent, but we receive great joy as well. I invite you to be intentional about looking down the road and increase your focus on those things that really matter. May we keep Christ at the center of our focus. In the midst of all the distractions, the things in front of the hood and the whirlwinds that surround us, I testify that Jesus is our savior and our redeemer and our rescuer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. One more talk and we'll get to hear our beloved prophet give his closing remarks. In a press conference on August 16, 2018, President Russell M. Nelson said, the Lord has impressed upon my mind the importance of the name he has revealed for his church, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We have work before us to bring ourselves in harmony with his will. Two days later, on August 18th, I was with President Nelson in Montreal, Canada, following our member meeting in the impressive Palais de Congrès, President Nelson answered questions from reporters. He acknowledged that it was going to be a challenge to reestablish the name of the church and undo a tradition of more than a hundred years. But he added, the name of the church is not negotiable. Seven weeks later, President Nelson spoke in general conference. The Lord impressed upon my mind the importance of the name he decreed for his church, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It was the Savior himself who said, for thus shall my church be called. Then he repeated, the name of the church is not negotiable. A good question surfaced. Why now, when for many decades we had embraced the nickname Mormon, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, the video spots, I'm a Mormon, the primary song, I am a Mormon boy. The doctrine of Christ is unchanging and everlasting, yet specific and important steps of the Savior's work are revealed at their appropriate time. This morning, President Nelson said, the restoration is a process, not an event. And the Lord has said, all things must come to pass in their time. Now is our time, and we are reestablishing the revealed name of the church. The identity and destiny of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints requires that we be called by his name. I was recently in Kirtland, Ohio, where the prophet Joseph Smith, with only a few members of the church, prophesied, this church will fill North and South America. It will fill the world. The Lord described the work of this dispensation as a marvelous work and a wonder. He spoke of a covenant that would be fulfilled in the latter days, allowing all the earth to be blessed. The words of this conference are being translated live into 55 languages. Eventually, these words will be heard and read in 97 languages in more than 220 countries and territories. When the Savior returns in majesty and glory, Faithful members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints 
will be among all nations, all people, all races, and all cultures of the world. The influence of the restored Church of Jesus Christ will not only be upon those who are members of the Church. Because of the heavenly manifestations in our day, because of the sacred scripture restored to the earth and the powerful gift of the Holy Ghost, we will be a shining light on the hill as the somber shades of disbelief in Jesus Christ darken the world. Although many may allow the world to cloud their faith in the Redeemer, we will not be moved out of our place. Christians who are not among our membership will welcome our role and our sure witness of Christ. Even those Christians who have viewed us with skepticism will embrace us as friends. In these coming days, we will be called by the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your noble efforts to advance the true name of the Church. In the conference three years ago, President Nelson promised us that our rigorous attention to use the correct name of the Savior's Church would bring us increased faith and access to greater spiritual power. This promise has been realized by devoted disciples across the world. Brother Lowry Ahola from the Eastern United States admits that at times he finds it awkward to share the full name of the church. But because of the prophet's counsel, he persists. On one occasion, he was visiting a friend at a church of another faith. Here are his words. An acquaintance asked, are you a Mormon? I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yes, I said. He started asking me several questions, each beginning with, does the Mormon Church believe? At each time, I began my answer with the phrase, in the restored Church of Jesus Christ, we believe. When he noticed that I wasn't accepting the title Mormon, he asked me point blank, are you not Mormon? So I asked him if he knew who Mormon was. He didn't. I told him that Mormon was a prophet and I was honored to be associated with him. But I continued, Mormon didn't die for my sins. Mormon didn't suffer in Gethsemane or die on the cross for me. Jesus Christ is my God and my Savior. And it is by his name that I want to be known. After a few seconds of silence, the acquaintance exclaimed, so you are a Christian. Remember President Nelson's words? I promise you that if we will do our best to restore the correct name of the Lord's church, he whose church this is will pour down his power and blessings upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints the likes of which we have never seen. The Lord always keeps his promises. He opens a way for us as we do his work. For years, we had hoped to purchase the internet domain sites, churchofjesuschrist.org and churchofjesuschrist.com. Neither was for sale. About the time of President Nelson's announcement, both were suddenly available. It was a miracle. The Lord has magnified our efforts in revising names that have long been attached to the church. Moving forward in faith, the name of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir was changed to the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. The website, lds.org, which received more than 21 million visits each month, was transitioned to churchofjesuschrist.org. The name of LDS Business College was changed to Ensign College. The website mormon.org was redirected into churchofjesuschrist.org. More than 1,000 products that had the name Mormon or LDS attached to them have been renamed. 
Faithful Latter-day Saints have adjusted their websites, podcasts, and Twitter accounts. We adopted a new symbol centered in Jesus Christ. At the center of the symbol is a representation of Torvaldsen's marble statue, the Christus. It portrays the resurrected living Lord reaching out to embrace all who will come unto him. Symbolically, Jesus Christ is standing under an arch, reminding us of the resurrected Savior emerging from the tomb. The typography of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has been adapted in more than 50 languages. New domain names have been acquired across the world. We appreciate the many good and gracious people who have honored our desire to be called by our correct name. I read an article recently that quoted a Catholic cardinal referring to the Latter-day Saints. As I visited with a leader of a Christian church a month ago in the eastern United States, he referred to the church in his first reference with our entire name and followed it up more than once with the Church of Jesus Christ. We realize that adding six words to our name would not be ideal for the media, but as President Nelson foretold, responsible media will be sympathetic in responding to our request. Thank you for extending to us the same consideration given cultural, athletic, political, or community organizations by using our preferred name. There will be a few who, hoping to detract or diminish the seriousness of our mission, will continue to call us Mormons or the Mormon Church. With courtesy, we again ask the fair-minded of the media to honor our desire to be called by our name of nearly 200 years. There are thousands and thousands of Latter-day Saints who have courageously proclaimed the name of the Church. As we do our part, others will follow. I love this story from Tahiti. Ten-year-old Iriura Jean resolved to follow the counsel of President Nelson. In her school class, they discussed their weekend, and Iriura talked about church. Her teacher, Vaite Pifau said, oh, so you are a Mormon. Iriura stated boldly, no, I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Her teacher replied, yes, you are a Mormon. Iriura insisted, no, teacher, I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Miss Pifau was amazed at Iriura's conviction and wondered why she was so insistent on using the long name of her church. She decided to learn more about the church. Later, as Sister Vaete Pifau was baptized, she expressed gratitude that Iriura heeded the counsel of President Nelson. The name of the church is not negotiable. Let us go forward in faith. When we willingly follow the counsel of the Lord as revealed through his living prophet, especially if it runs counter to our initial thinking, requiring humility and sacrifice, the Lord blesses us with additional spiritual power and sends his angels to support us and stand by us we receive the Lord's affirmation and his approval. I am an eyewitness to the power of heaven that rests upon our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. His most sincere desire is to please the Lord and bless our Heavenly Father's children. From sacred personal experience, I testify of the Lord's love for him. He is the prophet of God. I witness that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
At the conclusion of the conference, we express sincere appreciation to all who have worked so diligently to prepare for these services. We thank those who have spoken, those who provided the uplifting music, and those who have prepared the facilities. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following President Nelson's remarks, the choir will close this conference by singing, Sing We Now at Parting. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Kelly R. Johnson of the 70, and the conference will be adjourned. My dear brothers and sisters, for two days we have been well taught by servants of the Lord who have sought diligently to know what he would have them say. We've been given our charge for the next six months. Now the question is, how will we be different because of what we have heard and felt? The pandemic has demonstrated how quickly life can change at times from circumstances beyond our control. However, there are many things we can control. We set our own priorities and determine how we use our energy, time, and means. We decide how we will treat each other. We choose those to whom we will turn for truth and guidance. The voices and pressures of the world are engaging and numerous, but too many voices are deceptive, seductive, and can pull us off the covenant path. To avoid the inevitable heartbreak that follows, I plead with you today to counter the lure of the world by making time for the Lord in your life each and every day. If most of the information you get comes from social or other media, your ability to hear the whisperings of the Spirit will be diminished. If you are not also seeking the Lord through daily prayer and gospel study, you leave yourself vulnerable to philosophies that may be intriguing but are not true. Even saints who are otherwise faithful can be derailed by the steady beat of Babylon's band. My brothers and sisters, I plead with you to make time for the Lord. Make your own spiritual foundation firm and able to stand the test of time by doing those things that allow the Holy Ghost to be with you always. Never underestimate the profound truth that the Spirit speaketh of things as they really are and of things as they really will be. It will show unto you all things what ye should do. Nothing invites the Spirit more than fixing your focus on Jesus Christ. Talk of Christ. Rejoice in Christ. Feast upon the words of Christ and press forward with steadfastness in Christ. Make your Sabbath a delight as you worship him. Partake of the sacrament and keep his day holy. As I emphasized this morning, please make time for the Lord in his holy house. Nothing will strengthen your spiritual foundation like temple service and temple worship. We thank all who are working on our new temples. They are being built all over the world. Today, I'm pleased to announce our plans to build more temples at or near the following locations. Kaohsiung, Taiwan. Takloban, Philippines. Monrovia, Liberia. Kananga, Democratic Republic of the Congo, 
Antananarivo, Madagascar. Culiacan, Mexico. Vitoria, Brazil. La Paz, Bolivia. Santiago West, Chile. Fort Worth, Texas. Cody, Wyoming. Rexburg, North, Idaho. Heber Valley, Utah. And reconstruction of the Provo, Utah Temple after the Orem, Utah Temple is dedicated. I love you, dear brothers and sisters. The Lord knows you and loves you. He is your Savior and your Redeemer. He leads and guides his church. He will lead and guide you in your personal life if you will make time for him in your life each and every day. May God be with you until we meet again. I pray in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Our dear Father in heaven, we thy children express our gratitude for the opportunity that we have had to gather together this weekend to be instructed and edified. We love and sustain thy prophet and apostles. We have learned so much as we have gathered together. And now, Father, we pray for an added measure of courage and ability to move forward, to act in all diligence before thee. We are most grateful for thy beloved Son, even Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, our rock, and our sure foundation. And may we have an added measure of ability to bind ourselves to our Savior through our covenants and ordinances so that we may joyfully endure to the end and receive eternal life, the greatest of all thy gifts. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This has been a broadcast of the Sunday afternoon session of the 191st Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>